immense pleasure to welcome you all in the second edition of virtual Orange City Literature Fest 2020 Day 3, organized by SGR Knowledge Foundation. I, Ms. Purva Bangle, will be the anchor for this session. Today, we have with us Abir Kapoor, who is a journalist, board game designer, and author. He is the creator of India's first election based board game called The Poll, which has been featured in CNN, Vice, The Diplomat, and several other national and international publications. He is the author of The Most Notorious Jailbreakers, which was published by Rupa in 2020, which has just been acquired by T Series for digital rights. His articles have appeared in Hard News, The Wire, Scroll, Quartz, and others. He's currently building a new suite of games on digital citizenship and writing a graphic novel. With him, we have moderator Ms. Anushri Kaushal, who is an editor. She previously worked at Penguin Random House India, commissioning a range of fiction and non-fiction books, specializing in politics, international relations, and literary and genre fiction. She likes murder mysteries, a well-delivered joke, and all the things Russia. Today, for the next 40 minutes, she'll be in conversation with Sir Abir Kapoor on the topic. Let's uh, let's talk about the role of animals. No, so sorry. Let's have a talk on smugglers, jails, and escapes. The spotlight is all yours. Now I hand over this session over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Disappointing. It's Thanks a little a disappointing. Lot. It's a little what? disappointing. We're not talking about animals now. I know now. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I can't <laughs> no, 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 It's a no, joke. No, it's it's a joke. Don't worry about it. It's a joke. Adushri uh, appreciates a well delivered joke. I do appreciate it. <laughs> I did not know I appreciated it on this platform, but apparently I do. But uh, hi, Abir. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am uh, well. The effort for the next 40 minutes will be to crack a good joke. Yeah, you are supposed to deliver a joke well in the next yeah. 40 minutes. But uh, just okay. to just to tell everyone who is watching, uh, hi everyone to begin with, and welcome to this session with Abir Kapoor, who is, as you just heard, um, very talented, multifaceted. He does a bunch of things and he wears many many hats. Abir, you have uh, developed board games in the past. You're a yeah. journalist who has had a very steady crime beat too. Um, but most recently, you've written a book. It's called Most Notorious Jailbreakers. Here is my well-thumbed, sanitized copy. And uh, this is your first book. Um, it so is my first book. Thank you. Um, so, Abir, you and I have known each other for a while. And yes, we have. And one of the things that our friendship is kind of built on is our mutual love of detective fiction and crime fiction. Yeah, it binds us together in ways that uh, non-detective fiction fans will never know. They will never uh, understand it. Yeah. They will never understand what it takes to like find a good clue or like solve a, a, a daily mystery of like anything. Yeah, they will never understand walking into a drawing room with a dead body in the center of it, surrounded by... <laughs> Surrounded by a myriad group of people. Um, Who but, all look like cul culprits, right? They all, all they have that all, guilty look on their face. Yeah, they're all shady as hell. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, but um, uh, that fascination, your fascination with, with detectives and crime and criminals uh, is obviously has played a, a role in you writing this book. So um, should we talk about, you want to start talking about and tell everyone how you thought of this, why you had this idea, what was the genesis of the book, and uh, yeah, how you ended up writing it. So basically my origin story. Yes, your origin story and the book's origin story. Uh, so right off the bat, I I would uh, like to thank Rupa for giving me the opportunity to even write it. I think as a first time author, um, finding a publishing house is the, the challenge I think that has been um, a heavy push for a lot of people publishing online and self-publishing, but there is a great joy and, well, fascination and like access that public a good publishing house gives you. And Rupa has been very, very nice and has helped every like along the way. Now talking about um, the the book and how it sort of came out and what it took and why I'm fascinated in time is. 
I think crime has always been a part of the way we've seen the world. Every way, like you interact with it in any way, like you pick up something that you're not supposed to and you're like, should, like that feeling of wrongness and rightness is something yeah. that we all, all interact with. But yeah. I think the first sort of interaction that a lot of us have with crime fiction is detective fiction. Yeah. And, 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 and it starts with, and as invariably does with Sherlock Holmes. Uh-huh. Or Agatha Christie. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, Anushri is a Sherlock Holmes fanatic, and mm-hmm. like when you say Holmes, her face lights up. But um, so yeah, so the, the the first sort of interaction that happens is through detective fiction. I was really really lucky in the sense that I got uh, um, my the, the book that I got really hooked on to was Bonkish Bakshi. Mm-hmm. Uh, the um, and the Faluda detective stories, and like I think my copy of Picture Imperfect, which is the anthology of the Bonkesh Bakshi books by Sarindu Badapadi, I like is in tatters because I've read it so many times that now I think I can recite parts of it. Mm-hmm. But also, what I did was that I think it stuck with me at some point. I always wanted to be a detective. A very close friend, uh, his family would always say, "Abir, you'll grow up and be a detective." Uh, and we should start a detective agency. And that was all very, very exciting. So it sort of was something that I was always thinking about. It was always mm-hmm. a part of it, solving a crime, pretending you're a detective. And also then in my master's, I wrote my thesis on Bumkesh and through mm-hmm. him, the city of Calcutta, which in many ways gave me the vocabulary of understanding crime, right. which uh, then lent itself to even... So the, the 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 thesis was divided into the world of Bonkish and the world of the criminal. And what a lot of people don't realize is the world of the criminal is sometimes far more fascinating than that of the detective. The detective functions within order and he wants to bring the, the, the disorder and the chaos of the 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 criminal into the order of the of ordered society through law. So Moriarty in mm. in, in Sherlock Holmes, even in the recent Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, well, adaptation, or even in 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 uh, the Robert Downey Jr. one, hmm. he is is an agent of chaos. He, uh, the the criminal's job is to disrupt the ordered way of life. So when that happened, I started looking at a variety of ways that one can tell the story of India through specific bits of crime as well. And one of the cases that I started following was this beautiful case. uh, uh, and, and, And here, when I say beautiful case, it like points to this sort of strange beings. I think we are those who truly love crime fiction and crime is that we see murder suspense with such fascination, right? Like, let me see how that person died. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, yes. so, uh, yeah, an almost fetishization. And that fetishization is not complete without sort of getting into the world of the criminal. And mm. that's what this book is. It is an entry point into the world of 16 terribly, terribly evil people. You make such a good point about criminals being so important and kind of understanding detective fiction and obviously the genesis of detective fiction as a whole because I don't know who said it I feel like G.K. Chesterton said something like and I'm paraphrasing heavily but he said something like uh, the criminal is the creator the performer and the detective is merely the critic and yeah. without them there is going to be no detective fiction so so yeah but uh, you kind of cover a wide range of criminals in this book you yeah. have your thieves your serial killers your regular murderers yeah. And your favorite smugglers. And uh, you are very fascinated by this one gentleman called uh, Daniel Haley Walford Jr. Yeah. Uh, you, wanna, you want to tell me a little bit about him? I believe he was one of the first people you kind of fell in love with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fell in love with in the way that... So it's really interesting, right? Crime is not only like... There are various types of crimes. The crimes of passion, meditated crimes there are also sort of economic crimes, which is what Walcott Mm -hmm. was. So if Walcott was uh, was alive today and functioning with the same flair and buccaneership that he was back in the day, he'd be legal. Ah, you make that point in the book as well. Yes, yes, absolutely. Right. 
Yeah. <clears throat> so, and the entire set of like Mukesh Ambani, Adani, they're all be illegal. So they right. would be, uh, they they'd be part of the book if they ever got to jail. Uh, right. But what I'm saying is that Walcott. Okay, so the, this is how I introduce it. Like when I grow up, I'd want to be Walcott. When there's you grow this, up, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so there's this there's this man who gets born into some sort of poverty, moves his way up like a Gatsby-esque figure, mm. uh, and marries into wealth. No one knows who he is, where he comes from. Gets gifted two planes, starts this transatlantic flight service. Uh, is uh, and Purva, I think here's for you, and we can bring animals in. He <laughs> was uh, transporting exotic animals as a part of this from African countries to various zoos all over the world. Mm. And then he sets his eyes slightly higher and gets a contract from Air India to transport items from railway hubs to Afghanistan and back. Right. Uh, and what basically happens is that on one of these trips, someone gives a tip off that he's carrying shotgun cartridges. With, mm. And he was a great fan of hunting. He would provide these excesses to a lot of people who needed them. So now one one sort of thing, and I'll bring it back to smuggling because it is absolutely essential of how crime was um, identified at that time, that smuggling was how we got things back in the license raj. Right. If you needed a gun, you needed it smuggled. And if you needed borosil, you needed it smuggled. Mm. So like... So, yeah. so while there was an entire tier of items that you had to get smuggled from golden guns to borosil, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, we were we were um, uh, rallying and living the call of Atma Nirbharta, and, yeah. and 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 that's what it was. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> what happens is uh, Walcott gets caught mm. uh, in in a hung. hotel room. Yeah. And and yeah, and, and it's great, right? Like because each of these can be the like imagine this detective, right? And each of these 16 characters is someone that he catches. And that's yeah. how I was approaching this. Yes. Uh uh so Walcott gets caught hmm. and gets sent to jail and now begins one of the most colorful times of a gentleman in jail. He's presented in front of court hmm. repeatedly where he sort of tries to sell his planes to uh, uh, the government of India to fight the Chinese. He's caught tiptoeing across the Waga border. He's, he's, he's just, he's, yeah, he's just having the time of his life until, uh, until he gets, uh, he gets the Tatas who back then were uh, sort of primarily responsible for Air India to give his uh, bail of uh, 63,500. And then every day for two weeks, he convinces the government of India that he's the only one who can take look after his plane in yeah. Sadhajang Airport and he fills a little bit of oil and then just flies off one day <laughs> with a little like Hawaldar chasing his plane and then he lands in Karachi and holds a press conference against the bureaucratic ills of yeah. India. Oh so like and and then his life sort of carries on from from Karachi he goes to Beirut where he uh, catches sort of military installations, Beirut, uh, burns his effigy and hangs him in absentia. He yeah. gets a girlfriend in Israel. And he sort of comes back in 1963, 64 in India, mm -hmm. where he's finally caught, put on this amazing trial mm -hmm. where he's uh, accused of espionage and being a CIA agent. Oh. Spends the next two years in prison mm -hmm. where he's got this like exceedingly porous a uh, jail cell where women come and go talking with Michelangelo oh, and yeah and and he has a garden and then he sort of vanishes into thin air and then his story sort of grows from there again but what a chap what a colorful extraordinary man yeah. and one of the things that I found really intriguing was uh, that the pseudonym he uses is Philby right yeah who of course is one of the world's most famous double agents, one of the Cambridge Five. I don't know yeah, if there was yeah. any, yeah. Um, no connection, of course, but still, um, interesting. Kind I, of bet he, I think he was a man who lived his life with a sense of humor and would have right. gladly delivered your joke or two. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. My, my, uh, yeah, my sense of purpose is fulfilled now. No, but uh, you mentioned that, um, you know, smuggling was one of the ways to kind of 
get things, everything from, you know, a shotgun cartridge to a borosil um, during the license Raj. And one of the, one of the things that I really like about the book is that the people that you have chosen uh, to profile in this book are a very holistic range, like in terms of the times that they lived in as yeah. well. So you've kind of covered the entirety of independent India. Yeah. And when you were researching the book and when you were like um, identifying these people and doing backgrounds on them, uh, what did you kind of learn about the socioeconomic slash political progress of the country and how the nation grew through these people and through their acts and how kind of yeah. crime was in their time? So I, I'm so like, that's exactly what I had also intended to do. Tell okay. 16 stories and through that, tell a very specific history of India where mm -hmm. each type of crime is so, so sort of particular to it. Like from Mir like Ali being put into house arrest for, yes. for, for refusing to uh, uh, like, uh, a seed into India mm -hmm. and then smuggling himself out. And the most interesting part of that case was when the constitution of India was implemented, yeah. uh, he was detained according to an interim law. So yeah. he automatically gained freedom mm -hmm. because, because the laws yeah. that trapped him didn't exist anymore. Yeah. Uh, and you see these discussions, the wells of the house, you get a picture of this democracy that is being made. And mm -hmm. then you see someone like Natwarlal who cuts right across from like 1918 yes. To 1990, right? Exactly. Like yeah. this, this, this gentleman is a living embodiment of India, and perhaps his sort of crimes also change from mm -hmm. writing letters for toy companies to uh, duping people, smuggling, uh, you know, getting into a variety of different trades. And mm -hmm. each trade for Natwar Lal would be what is interesting at that time. Yeah. Uh, to Sukunarayan Bakya, one of my mm -hmm. sort of favorite characters and I think that chapter has also been a labor of love for me which yeah. is that this, this guy is just someone else but again born on on the coast a uh, the, the, uh, the product of a time where smuggling was the only way to quench people's thirst for items and their avarice builds that demand controls yeah. the market from there influences politics so you see that relationship between smuggling modernity politics all of that and you see how that is sort of fit together in this story mm -hmm. uh, you and then this Charles Sopraj was also a smuggler like yeah. his entire life was smuggling and then you see this like fundamental change when you get into the 80s and 90s mm -hmm. where the the history of India becomes one of tumult of, of subnationalism mm -hmm. right so you see yeah. You and you see that in the sort of people who are going to jail and trying to escape from it, right? So yeah. you see the Burels, you see, yeah. um, you see Burel, you see, um, I'm sorry, I just, um, um, you see the, uh, yeah, the Burel ones, and in the middle, you see war, you see POWs, you exactly. see. You see yeah. the war, you see so many soldiers trapped. Um, and then once this, and the LTTE, the, the sort okay. of subnationalism across the border. So you're yeah. seeing that sort of like socioeconomic tumult manifest itself into how prisons are being stocked up with people. And mm. then you 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 see the 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 early 2000s tell a completely different story, right? Yeah. You see you see um, the remnants of the Khalistan movement in the Nabha break, mm -hmm. you see the mm -hmm. rise of the, the the red corridor, which the Congress government, the UPA was attacking and their assertion. So you are able to see the terror of, of the red terror, as they called in the red corridor, sort of violently hit back. Mm -hmm. And then you also see a society that is dealing with a post-caste and still dealing with that with someone like Sher Singh Rath, who mm -hmm. confronts, mm -hmm. who confronts yeah. and assassinates a, a leader who is part of another generation to get that. So you also yeah. see that turn where, you know, you're looking back and harking back to a greater history of forward mm -hmm. castes. You see, mm -hmm. yeah, so so through that, through this book, in many cases, you've st I've managed to stitch together uh, 
a, a history, a narrative of India, which is exposed that different decades have different types of crimes, different decades have different compulsions, different decades mm. have different economic settings that come to determine the nature of the people who are being sent to jail. Right. And, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I was so impressed by the, the, with the, the range of the research that you must have had to do for this as well. And I'm always, when I'm reading nonfiction, I'm always very, very intrigued by the author's research process. And, you know, like you've mentioned in, in the book also that something like this is always limited by a lack of resources and lack of documentation yeah. and, you know, lack of access to archival material, etc. So or you even tell, jails. Even jail records, for example. Yeah. yeah. And, and you want to tell uh, everyone and me how you went about doing your research. And I'm pretty sure, you know, it must have taken a long, long time for you to put all of these stories together. And I know they're all... <laughs> really short in the in short versions in the book you know that yeah they, they appeared but yeah like tell me tell me how it how it went so now what is very interesting and i think anushri this will serve as a interesting nugget for you as well mm -hmm. is that one of the biggest challenges when writing about jail escapes is to get facts from the people who were in the prison at that time yeah and so it's it's twofold, right? Mm. One, that when there is a jailbreak, mm. the first thing that the person has to do is to go file a case against themselves. So one entire, yeah, so one <laughs> entire sequence of things. So so one thing we didn't talk about in, in the history is the, the post-Mandal assertion that you saw in the types of crimes as well. So you, mm. uh, and so you saw the Pintu Mahato, uh, the Nawada jail, yeah. jailbreak. Yeah, you yeah. saw the caste assertion coming out there. Yes. Um, and and that sort of also uh, takes form and shape in, in, in the Operation Jailbreak, which is a sort of straddles both worlds of yeah. the, the attack on Red Terror and the sort of deep-seated caste dynamics of Bihar. Uh, but what you see is that in the Pinto Mahato case, the moment they, there was the escape, and the Tata 407 left the compound, mm -hmm. the, <laughs> the jailer had to walk down to the closest police station and yeah. file an FIR against himself. So yeah. the moment um, in Charles Sobraj, uh, the, uh, Pushkar, VD Pushkar was subject to years of, of, uh, of cases and he was even put in jail. And that poor man, that poor, mm -hmm. poor man, was also in charge of Tehar is the same cell where Sher Singh Rana escaped from. Yeah. So trying to sh chase this man down and everyone is just like, he will never talk to you because these, this was perhaps the most embarrassing sort of economic impacting. He was put in jail. So police officers cannot talk about this yeah. because the, the, the jailers cannot talk about this because this is a moment of embarrassment for them. They yeah. face legal repercussions for allowing that because the court recognizes that escapes from prison can only happen if there is someone colluding with you. Yeah, yeah. Now, whether there's collusion or not, I don't know. But imagine like who in, in the Burial jailbreak, uh, hmm. That guy orders pizza for himself with a cell phone. Yeah. Right? <laughs> if that's being allowed to happen, who's going to yeah. talk to you? Yeah, yeah exactly. Right? Yeah. So, uh, 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 official sources out the window, right? Yeah. Leaving case files. Now, with case files, it's again, how did you escape? These are sort of sensitive matters because a lot of these escapes, uh, I think you've, you've, you've frozen. I've not. This is, yeah, you were you you got stuck. Uh, uh, I think yeah. I was just like admirably still. Anyway, go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm saying is that um, so poor Natwal Lal, like no one could write about Natwal Lal for so many years. He's like, bad aage or uska like paperwork <laughs> chalega. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. So like floods took his. So no one could like truly investigate Natwal Lal because every time there was like his papers were there, the flood would take them away. Yeah. So our country <laughs> has time. a document. Yeah, and our country <laughs> has a documentation problem. Yeah. So it's oh so, so like they cannot maintain like these papers. God knows ki kages dikhaye ya na dikhaye. So <laughs> like <laughs> so um, so yeah. So what actually happens is that 
it it so what actually is left is the handful of people who can talk to you about it who are outside the prison the second is the sort of exhaustive resource that the nmml has in mm. terms of old 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 newspapers that you have to also fight and sort of elbow people for time mm. uh because they have like on any good day five machines would work mm. and you're sitting there and you have to get there on friday at like <laughs> before 9 am to fill your name in for the rest of the week so yes. so yeah so it it it's not it's just a really terribly kept archive a sort of sensitive matter that mm. people can talk to them so like these short chapters aren't my fault it is yes. the paucity of material the ability to track down so like geeta parmar right like mm. she's a petty criminal and starts off with petty criminals a lot of mm. these people are notes in the io or you know the the gentleman who's doing the rounds the constable's mm. copy so yeah. there is no way that one can sort of figure out their life stories and their crime on the back of like six newspaper articles because they're so small they're so insignificant and yeah. suddenly there'll be a flare up in a moment and then they'll vanish and there'll be like yeah. three yeah yeah the, yeah, yeah there'll yeah, be three on. sources on this yeah no and i hope like uh, crimes that are getting committed now sadly i hope uh, they are uh, better recorded for like future abir kapoor's but abir i am getting a bunch of questions from the audience um wow. shall i ask them to you yeah for sure all right yeah. all right the first one is how is the face of smuggling evolved in the past few years in these years uh, it says so you you can choose the time period you want to all right so this is very very interesting so um smuggling has always been essential like um so one my favorite anecdote is that there is a specific type of boat hmm. that is found in the the arabian sea set right uh, uh which is the one near bombay and the coast and all of that yes. and there is yeah just checking my geography last moment <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like right like half confirming <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Go on. um and 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 you saw that like india like the the coastal africa in many ways was smuggling in items to oman through a specific type of boat called the dhau or dho mm-hmm. and these boats continued to be used and still are used today and mm-hmm. sukun narayan bakia for example was largely smuggling through dhaus or those mm. i don't know how to pronounce that and most of these were sort of retrofitted to be smuggling and yes. uh, smuggling boats and this has been going on for centuries mm. so the first wave of modernization that oman saw in like the late 18th century because it was an exceedingly rigid society was through the items that were smuggled in through those mm mm-hmm. you see the porous nature of the myanmar and bangladesh border where a variety of items are smuggled in cows are smuggled across the border you mm-hmm. have drug smuggling that happens in the punjab border you have a variety of ways that has happened now but if we go back to the colonial period mm-hmm. you see that calcutta as a city emerges on the back of international smuggling groups and mm-hmm. the first sort of iteration of international smuggling groups laid the foundation for what were to now come as mncs these were multi regional multi race multi country ethnic communities that were sort of dealing in the triangular trade in a way that the east india company didn't want them to because mm. they wanted monopoly over the revenues so so private illegal forms of 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 trade is smuggling yes so going, in license yeah, yeah go, ahead, go ahead sorry no 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 yeah. no, no go ahead no i was just going to say that i mean it's it's uh, it's always going to remain kind of essential uh, to the economics of a country simply because it's like a supply demand kind of a scenario which smuggling yeah. and yeah. fulfilling um but yeah sorry you were saying something about license raj with where and when i yeah morarji desai implements kofe posa which sort of severely limits the amount of gold that families mm-hmm. can own so right. and this automatically sort of leads to a parallel economy where people who are into like 
luxury items, who want gold, who yeah. want Swiss watches, cannot hold them anymore. Right. So when you set a limit to what you can own, of course the mind will want more. And yeah. in 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 like if I was to tell you Anishi no more like shopping tomorrow, you'd be like, can I do it behind like someone's back? Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. So that that's the thing. Let's move on to the next question. Yeah, the next one is actually pretty interesting. Do you think smuggling can be justified? Any form of trade which is sort of so, as I said, East India Company wanted a monopoly over the trade of opium. If anyone did that other than them, it was smuggling. Mm. If, so, so smuggling as piracy and smuggling as uh, uh, it. See, it is it. It's entirely based on the legal structure and legal system of a country. Yeah. And as as we notice in this book, the the laws evolve. Sukhar Narayan Bakia today would be an exceedingly legitimate person so for example yeah. when the land ceiling and the land laws change in Naman and you he moves into property and yeah. his family is now one of the largest property developers in the country in that region right but what was also very interesting is that they fitted each house with smuggling capacity so they all had smugglers alcoves in them so right. when a ship would come, they would sort of like steal a lot of things and put them there. But but smuggling can be justified much like the... Uh, uh, it, smuggling can be justified in the same way that you can question whether anyone has the has the, the right to impose certain laws on you. Uh, mm -hmm. Laws change in fashion, laws change with time, so do various definitions. Whether... Yeah. And, and, and that's how it is. Yeah. Thanks. Interesting answer to a very interesting question. Um, yeah. And this third question that has been asked is actually, I was going to ask you myself, is, uh, and they say, which is the most epic escape story you know of? So what's your, what's your favorite? What's the most, what has the most daring do? What has the more dared, most daredeviltry? Um, and what's your so, favorite? If there are two different ones, then, you know, please give yeah. one. So, so Burel, most definitely. Borel mm -hmm. for me was something that was absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. It was how an entire jail as a system gets taken mm -hmm. over. You're able to order pizza. You mm -hmm. and then for months you're digging this tunnel and no one finds out. And every time someone comes in, you're like, "Hum wait to tha rahe." So hmm. that entire sort of co-option of the jail system by these three people under the garb of religion was hmm. just phenomenal for me yeah. like like and, and it's definitely a hat tip right like yeah. you've been and and you're trying to escape for years right yeah. there are three attempts one time someone sends you like rdx in the laddu box yeah right <laughs> yeah so <laughs> so there is definitely something about it the yeah. other one the other one that I sort of truly, really, really like is uh, Gita Parmar, which is mm. this mm. this lady who is called the Queen of Baikula because she uh, goes. So, so basically, she's transported from jail to jail throughout mm. her her life because wherever she goes, she becomes and takes over the jail. So, one mm. really interesting story is that there were two toilets in the women's yeah. prison. And mm. she kept one for herself, mm. for three other friends, and 120 other women had to use another toilet. Jesus and, mm. and she's known to slap like uh, wardens and all of that. And 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 who knew that she was a kung fu champion? So in one of these ways that she's being sort of transported, she yeah. sort of gets out of the uh, train to stretch her legs. Mm. incapacitates three guards this is the woman who's incapacitated three guards and just runs into the nothingness of the world to go <laughs> see her child so i thought that was a exceedingly compelling compelling story uh i i particularly um enjoyed the the nevada and the operation jailbreak for their sort of Candidness, like yeah. like blazeness, right? We yeah. just blew up the entire. Yeah, uh, yeah. The the Napa jailbreak was very exciting, not because of the way they sort of stormed in, 
but mm. what happened before and what happened after like an entire sort of western feeling of people running through the countryside it was mm. more a bank and robber sort of feel to it than that momentary jail escape right um i just want to quickly check at this point with purva purva do we have uh, time left uh yes ma'am we are left with 3 more minutes okay abir in 3 minutes i want to understand from you what are you uh, working on now in terms of book what are you writing now because uh, we really want to see like something similar but also you know i want to know what what you're working on so so a friend of mine ujjan datta is a fantastic illustrator mm-hmm. uh he does a lot of the illustrations for the jaipur literature festival Thank so you. he and i and you know this but yes. he and i have been working on a secret project right. uh it's a it's a graphic novel mm-hmm. uh titled zoravar and the lost gods so uh not going to talk a lot about it but it's about this young man in in the uh, enduring colonial times who's an astrologer oh, and wow. and and finds himself caught in a variety of um uh, troubled times trying to save and secure the treasures of india from the british and their greed right so that that sounds really talk. cool abir and i hope you're uh, working kind of full force on it and we get to see it sometime soon is that yes is that in the yes, offing we'll, hopefully fingers crossed okay okay and uh, and i okay. also will be taking uh, uh, this smuggling idea to its sort of logical conclusion to be writing about how smuggling helped make modern india yeah i was going to actually ask you that because like i was saying earlier that these pieces are really small to all be held in one book and you must have really wanted to kind of expand on at least a few of these and yeah. turn it into a full length narrative so yeah, yeah uh, so i'm glad to hear you're going to be working on this but any of these people are going to feature in so it so if yeah yeah so like bakhya will uh, walcott will all the smugglers will but there is so much more to be written about smuggling in yes. india okay great yeah. um, so thank you abir for uh, telling us about um criminals and crime and why you love them so much and how we should also research them more find out more about them and to yeah. everyone who is watching i would really urge you to go forth go to your nearest bookstore um if bookstores are really far away only then you go to amazon slash flipkart and buy a copy of abir kapoor's the most support local areas. bookstores Please really support do. local bookstores. Really support local bookstores. And to the extent that if you tell me where your local bookstore is, and you really want to read my book and you want it signed, I will do. I will undertake that journey as long as it's in Delhi. Uh, yeah. And otherwise, to to sign and send you guys a copy. And if you do want, I am available on Twitter. And if you have a copy and you want it signed and something nice written on it, let me know. i will send me a copy and i will write it and send it back to you and i shall cover a cottage oh uh, thanks for the generous offer abir and uh, his handwriting is really nice as well so everyone get a copy signed as long as he's willing to sign them and um thank you so much i'm going to hand this over back to you back okay thank you so much for that scintillating conversation sir and ma'am I am sure our audience was delighted to witness it. I also thank our audience and the SGR Knowledge Foundation for organizing this event for us. On behalf of Orange City Literature Fest, we sincerely express our gratitude towards your acceptance for the session and knowledge obviously shared with us. Also, I hope everyone have a great evening ahead. Stay safe. Thanks. Bye. 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 But oi anushri yes uh call me regular line i want to show you a, a, i'll just send you a google uh, link i okay. want to show you something really cool okay fine just call you i'm That sending happened. it to you now okay I'll, i'll just call you, you i'll see it and call you okay bye bye that's for the 20 years of existence two universities 23 educational institutes offering 137 courses 
Rice Only Group of Institutions, a vision beyond.